Bibles to the book of Genesis. Genesis 26 is where we'll be starting uh, this morning. If you look at the life of Jacob, we've been looking at the different patriarchs. We've been looking at Noah, Cain and Abel. Uh, yesterday we looked at uh, Abraham and Isaac. And now we're looking today, and God willing, for time together, uh, Jacob and Joseph. So uh, our study this morning, looking at the life of Jacob, Jacob really is a major character in the book of Genesis. A lot of chapters are devoted to his story. Maybe in kind of a surprising way almost, uh, how much time he gets, screen time in the book, as it were. We're going to try to see his life as a whole. We can't tell every story, focus on everything. We will try to cover a lot of his life. And I think we'll, one thing we'll see as we look at this story is we maybe think of the patriarchs as having nice, righteous, godly lives. <coughs> Jacob does not live the life that Abraham and Isaac uh, did, or at least what we know of Abraham and Isaac's life. And that might surprise us, but we see then the redemption of Jacob turning, turning to be uh, a man of faith and a man with a good heart. So let's jump in as we learn about the birth of Jacob and his twin brother Esau. I think for, uh, for sake of time, I won't start by reading all of these paragraphs, but we're in Genesis chapter 25, verse 19 and following, where Isaac has married Rebekah, and Rebekah is barren, so Isaac prays for her to be able to have a child, and she does, but she starts feeling some stuff going on inside. It's a struggling within her, and she says, why is this happening to me? And she doesn't know that she has twins. And so the Lord tells her in verse 23, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. So it's time for her to give birth uh, to these, these children. And this is when Jacob and Esau are born. The first one comes out red, his body like a hairy cloak. Uh, and so they name him Esau. And after that, his brother is born. And, and when Esau is born, Jacob is grabbing onto his brother's heel. Now, that doesn't make as much sense as because we don't have a, a phrase in our language, he's a heel grabber. But we have a, uh, a phrase in our language, he's pulling your leg. And what does that mean? He's pulling your leg. It means he's like, he, he's not really quite serious. He's not, uh, he's kind of joking with you a little bit. So it seems in Hebrew there's this uh, expression of, oh, he's grabbing your heel. I mean, he's trying to get at you. He's a cheater. He's a trickster. And so it's kind of funny, right? He comes out grabbing his heel. Huh, we'll name him Jacob. He's a heel grabber. He's a trickster, a cheater. And that ends up being quite descriptive of his actual character. Well, the boys grow up, and Esau is loved by his father. He's a uh, skillful hunter. He brings in food that his dad liked with the meat. But Jacob tends to stay at home, a quiet man dwelling in tents, and Rebekah loves Jacob. And so there's favoritism going on in the home, which is so destructive. Well, we have kind of our first story of Jacob, once he's uh, a person to tell a story about. <coughs> and uh, Jacob's at home making food. He's making some red lentil soup here. This is uh, Genesis 25, verses 29 and following. And Esau's been out hunting or doing whatever in the field and comes in home and he's exhausted. He's famished. We say he's starving. <coughs> And he comes and says, Jacob, give me some of that food. Uh, I'm exhausted. That red stew. And the red stew, the word for red, ends up giving him the name of Edom. And the Edomites are the descendants of Esau. So Jacob is there. I imagine him kind of stirring this up. You know, he says, okay, I'll give you some food. If you give me your birthright. Wait, really? Uh, maybe you've heard this story before, and so that doesn't surprise you too much. What a terrible, mean thing to do to your brother who's hungry. So yeah, I'll give you some of my food when you're starving, if you sell me your birthright. And Esau is foolish enough to say, oh, if I die right now, what does it even matter? So he, he gets it, he gives him some of the stew and some bread, and he, he swears, I swear to me now, he does, and gives his birthright to Jacob. And since he despised his birthright, it's that idea of minimizing it. He didn't honor it, he didn't value it, he despised it, lowered it and gives away his birthright and swears an oath to be giving away his birthright to his brother. Well, uh, we jump forward then to Genesis 27. We looked at Genesis 26 yesterday. But we come to the story in Genesis 27, and here is where Jacob deceives his father to uh, steal now the blessing from his brother Esau. 
So we look at this story here. It says in Genesis 27, verse 1, When Isaac was old, his eyes were dim, so he couldn't see. He called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I don't know the day of my death. Now take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And prepare for me delicious food, such as I love. And bring it to me so that I can eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. And so uh, Isaac's old. He uh, can't see very well. And I'm guessing part of this story involves the fact that he's like other older people. And his hearing is not as good either. I think that maybe play a factor in, in Jacob being able to, to trick him as he does. But he can't see, so he says, I, I'm about to die. I want you to go make me some good food and bring it back, so I'm going to impart the blessing. And if there's a distinction to be made uh, biblically here in the book of Genesis between the blessing and the birthright, the birthright seems to be the double portion, kind of the, the double good, and, and Joseph actually receives the birthright. He receives the double portion when Jacob has his children. But the blessing seems to be this passing down of what ends up being the messianic line and that, and that blessing of God to this son and not that son. And so the Messiah will come through Jacob because of the blessing he steals in this chapter. Now, Rebecca, <coughs> who loves Jacob, she overhears that, that, uh, that Isaac's about to bless Esau. So she calls in her son and says, Look, I want you to come in and, and get this blessing. Uh, this is what I heard your father saying. So now, my son, verse 8, Obey my voice as I command you. So go to the flock, get some goats, or to prepare uh, this food and and uh, make for your father so that he can bless you. And Jacob says, verse 11, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth man. What if my father feels me? And I think I'm mocking him, and he'll curse me instead of blessing him. And she says to him these ominous words, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go bring them to me. And she will feel the sting of, of the consequences of this action the rest of her life. So they do. They, uh, they go out and get those goats from their own uh, field and prepare the food. They take the goat's skins and put that on Jacob so that he feels hairy. But Esau's clothes on Jacob, which will end up making him smell like his brother. And he goes in uh, to his father's tent there. And verse 18 comes in and says, My father. Uh, and he says, Here I am. Who are you? Jacob says to his father, I'm Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you told me. I said, I'm going to eat of my game that your soul may bless me. Now Isaac says to his son, How is it that you found it so quickly, my son? That food. How did you get that, that deer, that whatever, so quickly? And uh, Jacob says, Because the Lord, your God, granted me success. Can you believe that he uses God and God's name here in this lie as an excuse? Now let me also note that he says, uh, the Lord, your God. We're going to find out Jacob's not the most religious guy here in the beginning uh, of his life. And so I, he comes near to Isaac. Uh, Isaac says that the voice is Jacob's voice, but his hands are the hands of Esau with the hairiness. He says, are you really my son Esau? Says, One last time to get out. Verse 24, he answers, I am. I am Esau. So he eats the food, says, come near my son and kiss me. And he does, and he smells his garments, and he blesses him, and repeats those words that we've seen in the book of Genesis. Uh, curse be those who curse you. Bless be everyone who blesses you. May you be Lord uh, over your brothers. And passes on this blessing to his son. So Jacob scurries out of that tent, just as Esau's kind of coming back. And Esau comes in and says, here's the food, Father. Please come and bless me. He says, who are you? Says, I'm Esau. And Isaac trembles. And realize that Jacob has stolen the blessing. And there's not really much of a blessing left to give. Esau says, can you give me some kind of blessing? And the blessing he gives just isn't really that, that particularly good. Uh, and so Esau hates Jacob. And Esau says to himself, uh, the days of my mourning, days of mourning for my father approaching when, when he dies, then I will kill my brother Jacob. So this is passed on. Rebecca overhears this and says, Jacob, you're going to have to run. You're going to have to go and uh, go back to where my family is in Haran and Padan, Aram, and uh, go there until Esau's anger passes away. She says in verse 45, Why should I be bereft of both of you in one day? But she will be. I mean, Rebecca will lose essentially kind of both of her sons uh, through this. So Jacob does run away. And in Genesis 28, uh, he, he runs off to Laban uh, in Padan Aram. That's uh, Rebekah's brother. And Jacob's leaving Beersheba. This is verse 10 and following. Going towards Haran. Comes to a certain place there. 
finds a stone to make it a, a pillow, lies down to sleep. Maybe remember the story. And he has this dream, this vision of this stairway or a ladder. Stairway going up to heaven. He sees kind of God at the top of that ladder. And he sees angels coming down, coming down, and angels going up. And uh, what's the point of that? Well, if you can kind of picture that, the, the point of that image is, is pretty obvious. You know, you see angels coming down from heaven, coming down, and they go this way and that way and scurry. And then angels come, come from all over and coming up and climbing up the stairway. It looks like there's this kind of this access point to God there. It's like he found the, the portal or something. You know, there is where God is, and angels are coming like a, you know, some, some magic doorway. That's what he's going to say. He's going to wow, this is the house of God. He names it Bethel, and then this gateway to God. But as he sees this, and God speaks to Jacob there as he's on the run, kind of for his life, a fugitive, with nowhere to lay his head. And God says to him in verse 13 and following, I am the Lord, God of Abraham your father, the God of, of Isaac. The land in which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. And he says, I'm going to be with you, I will keep you, repeat some of these blessing ideas. And he says to him, I won't leave you until I've done to you what I promised. I'm going to be with you and protect you and watch over you. Jacob awakes and says, ah, the, the Lord's in this place, I didn't even know it. And he names the place, the house of God, uh, Bethel. So that sets up a stone there. And so Jacob, running for his life, sees this stairway to God and receives the promises of Abraham. And I want to pause here. I want to think about what we've covered so far. Okay. <coughs> what do we know about Jacob so far? Well, he's born, so our first real story involves him uh, being terrible to his brother. Brother coming in, <coughs> needing food, and says, yeah, I'll give you some food if you give me your birthright. Story number two of Jacob involves him going in and stealing the blessing, lying, deceptive to his father, uh, and uh, it, it's a pretty egregious kind of bad ways. Uh, what do we think about this guy? There's, there's not much admirable at all. And in fact, he kind of gotten away with the birthright and the blessing, and now of all things, as he's running away, God comes down <coughs> and says to him, you shouldn't have done that, that was terrible. Is that what God says to him? No, God says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bless you. Everything's going to be fine. And we might be thinking, wow, Jacob really got away with it. I mean, he did all those things, and he got scotch free. It's going to be fine. He's going to go and live away for a while, and he's going to come back. And he really uh, got Esau, and is totally getting away with it. What we're going to find out in the story is Jacob does not get away with it. He's going to suffer immensely for the rest of his life because of the consequences of these actions. So let's look at what happens in Genesis 29. So Jacob shows up there. He's close to where Laban lives. And uh, he's there with some uh, shepherds. There's kind of a well there. And they kind of have this security system with the well. They have this big, heavy stone over the well so that one guy can't come and like do something bad with the water. It takes like you know, multiple people to move this stone. And that kind of keeps it a little safeguard. So when the shepherds come together, they move the stone. Well, Jacob is talking to the people there, and he sees Rachel, this girl, coming from afar. And he musters the strength. You can see the picture there. He sees her coming. He musters the strength to move this heavy stone by himself and waters her, uh, uh, waters her flock there and grabs her, you know, weeps aloud, uh, kisses her there, finds out that this is Rebecca's son. They run back home together. Our poor Jacob is smitten. He is in love with this girl. He goes home to his uncle Laban. Laban says, "Surely your bone, uh, you're my bone and my flesh. You know we're family." Stays there a month. Now in this month, I'm guessing Laban has figured out the obvious. But Jacob is in love with his daughter. Now it's a second daughter. He's got older uh, daughter Leah. Now, it says in verse 17 here that Leah's eyes were weak, or your your translation may say uh, soft. Either way, it's not a very great compliment. You know, Leah's eyes, she's got nice eyes, but Rachel is beautiful in form and appearance. You know, there's just no comparison here. And, you know, Leah's got, she's got a nice personality, but Rachel is beautiful. Now, Laban knows what he's doing, and we're going to find out that Laban is able to, to take advantage of Jacob at every turn. So he sees this, this guy. Smitten with his daughter. So Laban says in verse 15, uh, Because you're my kinsman, we're family. Should you serve me for nothing? Tell me, what do you want your wages to be? And that should be a, that should be a red flag for us. 
that he's letting Jacob set up the wages. Why, why might he do that? Imagine if you're you're an antique kind of shopper kind of person. Okay, so you go to an antique store and you find the table you've always wanted. It's beautiful. It's perfect. Like, this is this is exactly what you want. And it's obvious, right? It's obvious that you're in love with this table. And the guy, antique store owner, he comes up and says, "You know, I, I can tell you want this table. Why don't you tell me what you think uh, you should pay for it?" Well, why would someone do that? Because you're going to over, you're going to overpay, you're overbid. You know, you're going to do that. So he says to him, "You know, why don't you tell me what you should pay for me?" And so Jacob, in love, says, "I'll serve you seven years for Rachel." And I'm guessing that was that was a pretty high price. But he's willing to do it because he's in love, right? That's a romantic, nice thing to do. So Laban says, "Okay." Okay, I'll take it. And it says in verse 20, in their youth and romance, verse 20, so Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Okay, so Jacob's fallen in love, love there. It's been seven years. Verse 21, Jacob says to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So they, they gather together people, they have this feast. It says in verse 23, But in the evening, <coughs> Laban took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went in to her. Verse 25, in the morning, behold, it was Leah who gave him the wrong daughter. And Jacob says to Laban, what is this you've done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? What, what's just happened to Jacob? Jacob marries Leah. Now, Jacob will marry Rachel, he has to wait seven days, uh, and he gets to marry Rachel right away. Uh, but then he has to serve, he's contracting now to serve another seven years to get Rachel. So ends up serving her, serving for 14 uh, years uh, uh, for, for these two uh, daughters. Now I want you to think about this. Here's a little chart of Jacob's deceptions. Jacob, when he was uh, tricking his father to get the blessing, there before old blind Isaac, Jacob switched himself, the younger, for the older. And then Laban switched the older for the younger. Jacob took advantage that he couldn't be recognized by his father's blindness. And uh, Laban took advantage of the fact that Leah wouldn't be recognized, whether the, the, the wedding veil or the darkness of the night or whatever. Jacob took something that he wanted, the blessing, the birthright, and then Jacob got stuck with something he didn't want. What do we see going on here? We would call this poetic justice, right? The Bible would call this an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is him receiving what he's given. <coughs> uh, talionic justice. Let's tally on this. Uh, the, the law of the two. This is him receiving what he's given out already. This is God bringing justice on Jacob's head. Well, things don't get better. In Genesis 30, end of 29 and 30, is, is the chronicle of Jacob with his wives and, and receiving. He gets 12 children here uh, in, in this chapter. Benjamin will be born for a little while, but there's sister uh, Dinah. And so he had all these children born. And what we see is that, that Laban really uses Jacob. I mean, it's almost funny if it wasn't so painful how much Jacob is able to manipulate, uh, Laban's able to manipulate uh, Jacob. So he's already worked for 14 years. And uh, Laban uh, is uh, wanting, wanting him to continue to work. And so Jacob knows this guy, right? He knows that, that Laban's going to take advantage of every turn. And so Jacob says to him in verse 29, Genesis 30, 29, You know how I have served you, and your livestock is fair with me, for I had little before I came, and it has increased abundantly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turn. Now how shall I provide for my own household? So Laban, uh, again, let's Jacob set the terms. What shall I give you? Jacob says, don't give me anything. And here's Jacob's idea. He says, this is how we'll know that you're not tricky. <coughs> we'll just take the less desirable animals, the speckled, the spotted, the, the black uh, uh, of the goats, the less desirable ones, and those will be mine. And it'll be clear that they're mine. And you can't say that I cheated you. Why would, why would Jacob think that? You can't say that I cheated you. It'll just be clear that those are my goats, and I've been taking your goats, and that those are yours, and, and all of that. And so Laban says, okay, that sounds good. That'll be our agreement. What does Laban do? So, verse 35, But that day Laban removed the male goats, or striped and spotted, and all the female goats are speckled and spotted, everyone that had white on it, every lamb that was black, and put them in charge of his sons. It said a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob pastured the rest of the flock. See what he did? Laban said, that's a great idea. Go get the spotted ones. 
and, and go take this somewhere else. See what's happening to Jacob? I mean, it's miserable for him here. This is a terrible master to work for. In chapter 31, Jacob is just frantically trying to escape. I mean, Jacob, Jacob is just stuck there under this guy who's uh, misusing him. And so he kind of takes advantage of the fact that Laban's out shearing his sheep. And he calls his wives into the field. He's like, we got to go. This is terrible. And uh, so he gets his wives, gets the kids. And uh, look at what Jacob says to his wives there. Uh, verse, Genesis 31, verse 6. You know that I served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not permit him to harm me. And, and so Jacob, they get their stuff, they get their wives and their kids, and they go run off. Well, of course, Laban is furious and chases after them and, and uh, comes back, finds out all of this, and, and, and runs Jacob down. And uh, there's some episodes there. Well, look at verse 36. Then Jacob became angry and berated Laban. Jacob said to Laban, What's my offense? What's my sin that you've hotly pursued me? Uh, look down at verse 38. These 20 years I've been with you. Your ewes and your female goats not miscarried. I've not eaten the rams of your flock. What was torn by wild beasts I didn't bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. From my hand you required it, whether it was stolen by day or stolen by night. So, so Laban's been a hard master. Anything that went wrong got taken off of Jacob's paycheck. Look at verse 40. There I was. By day the heat consumed me, and the cold by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These twenty years I've been in your house, I've served you fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for my flock, and you've changed my wages ten times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. If Jacob hadn't run away with all his stuff, and God spoke into Laban in a dream and all that, because you would have kicked me out with nothing. <coughs> And uh, that's the kind of guy Laban was. Have the years been good <coughs> to Jacob? They've been terrible. See that picture? In the day it was hot, at night it was cold, and sleep fled from my eye. It's been a really rough 20 years. And now he's headed back to the land of Canaan. Has Jacob gotten in the way with any? He hasn't. In Genesis 32 is where Jacob's headed back to the land of Canaan, and he finds out that Esau, that brother, remember, who's wanting to kill him, Esau's headed his way with 400 men. And Jacob thinks, oh no, this is it. This is it. And Jacob tries some schemes here. You know, he, he, he tries some things to, to make things better. One thing he does is he sets up his family into two separate camps, so that if Esau attacks the one... Uh, that you know, the other one can, can flee. And, and Jacob uh, is going to give presents, give these goats and these milking camels and these uh, bulls and these things to help appease his brother Esau. But uh, Jacob is scared. <coughs> Jacob is scared. And what's interesting is we have in Genesis 32, when Jacob's afraid for his life, he now with flocks and herds and good things and with, with a large family, Esau's coming out with 400 men. And we have the first recorded prayer of Jacob. I don't mean he didn't pray before, but this is the first time we're told about him praying. And Jacob has not been the man of faith so far that Abraham and Isaac were. Abraham characteristically would go places and build altars and call on the name of the Lord. Isaac did the same. We can see Jacob doing that kind of thing. But here in his fear, Jacob turns to God. Read with me this prayer in Genesis 32 verse 9 and following. And Jacob said, O God of my father, Abraham, and the God of my father, Isaac, O Lord who said to me, Return to your country, to your kindred, that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you've shown your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I've become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Okay, what's this prayer here? Well, it's a good prayer. I think it's a really good prayer. And did you notice this line here? I am not worthy of your blessing. Now Jacob says, I'm not worthy of the least of your blessings. 
I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and the faithfulness that you've shown. Now, I, I wrestle with having a bad attitude. I wrestle with not being as thankful as I should. And Jacob would have a lot to complain about to God about the past 20 years. But Jacob doesn't do that. He doesn't go there. And in his heart, he, he says, God, you've taken care of me. You have blessed me. You've brought me back. You've really been with me like you said you would. And as he turns to God, he's not complaining. He says, Lord, I'm not worthy of the way you've been faithful to me and good to me. And, and then he prays. He says, please deliver me from the hand of my brother. And he calls on God's promise. Verse 12, you said I'll surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea. And, and so Jacob is grateful. Jacob is humble here. And he approaches God not on the basis of his merit. <coughs> Maybe Jacob would be tempted to say something like, God, please bless me. Look at, look at what I've done. And look at what I haven't done. And, and see, see my good things. And so God, please bless me. Almost a bargaining for the <coughs> He doesn't. He really just calls upon God's promise. And says, God, you promised me this. And uh, please fulfill your promise. Could we pray these kind of prayers? Say, God, you've been so faithful and so good. I'm not worthy. Thank you for all those things. And God, I pray that you just fulfill your promises. You promised you'd be with me. You promised that you'd help me. That you would strengthen me. Uh, please fulfill your promises to me. God wants us to remind him of his promises. We see that throughout the scriptures. We're, we're not telling God something he doesn't know anyways. And to bring those things that God has said back to God. Say, God, remember you said this? Please do that. And you said this? Please do that. That's a great way to pray. And Jacob has a good prayer here. Let's take a minute just to look quickly at this episode, and we'll move forward. The end of this chapter is this interesting story of Jacob kind of wrestling with this angel, wrestling with God here. So he sends his family, crosses the ford, Jacob's alone, verse 24. And after kind of dealing with his family, out of nowhere it says, And a man wrestled with Jacob until the break of day. Wait, what? Either you just kind of live in your life there and someone shows up and starts having a wrestling match with you through the night. Wrestle with Jacob till the breaking of day. When the man saw didn't prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip gets out of joint. And uh, the man says, Let me go, for day's broken. And Jacob says, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And he says, What's your name? <coughs> Jacob. He says, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, which means strives with God. You shall not be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Jacob says, please tell me your name. He says, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place, named the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life was delivered. What is going on here? So Jacob is, is, is doing his thing, and a man wrestles with him through the night. It turns out to be God that he's wrestling with. And, and God says to him, I'm going to call you Israel, he who strives with God, because you've striven with God and men and have prevailed. A lot of people interpret the story different ways. Uh, I think what this story is really an example of is of Jacob praying and Jacob turning to God. And this is a, in kind of a physical form of him wrestling with God through the night. Jacob turns to God and says, I'm not letting you go until you what? Until you bless me. And that's how we need to be with God. God, I am clinging to you in prayer. I am clinging to you in faith. Because there's nowhere else to go. And there's nowhere else where I can get a blessing. I'm clinging to you until you bless me. Remember what Jesus said? He says, you need to pray like this. But not to pray always and never lose heart. Because it's like a widow who needs justice. And she goes to this judge who doesn't fear God or man. And he doesn't care about her plight. But he's the guy who needs to help her. And so she goes day after day after day. Until she gets justice. Until whatever her situation is, he's taken care of. And the guy looks at this widow showing up day after day and says, Look, I don't care about people. I don't care about God. But if I don't give this widow what she wants, she's going to wear me down with her continually coming before me. And so it grants her. And God says, how much more so will God give justice to his elect and cry to me day and night? Surely that justice will come speedily. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? We've got to cling to God. Say, God, I'm not letting go until you bless me. In faith, you're the only place to go. Lord, where else shall we turn? You alone have the words of life. And God, there's this, this thing going on in my life here. 
and this thing over here. And God, I'm clinging to you. I'm praying, and I'm not letting go until you bless me. I think that this shows up a little bit in the book of Colossians. I don't know if you ever noticed it, but Paul says something curious. In Colossians chapter 2, he says to the brethren there, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 1, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, and for those of Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, be knit together in love, etc. And he said, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. Well, what does that mean? What, what, what are you struggling with? Well, this language is made clear because Paul says the same thing about Epaphras in chapter 4. Look at what he says about Epaphras in Colossians 4. The same terminology, Colossians 4, verse 12. Epaphras is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. Oh, I get what you were saying in chapter 2 now. When you're struggling for them, you're saying about struggling in prayer for them. Now, do we see prayer as this kind of struggle? Or what's it a struggle? Well, this word for struggle is this word for agonize, and it was a word that, that meant to struggle and to wrestle and to fight. Maybe a connection back there to Jacob, right? He's been wrestling in prayer for you. I've been wrestling in prayer for you. And that maybe encapsulates this picture of prayer where it's a challenge. We've got to keep our mind focused and our heart attentive. And I'm making this time, and I'm going to sit here and wrestle with God for you. God, please bless these people. Help their hearts to be encouraged and strengthened. And he's been praying. He's been wrestling for you. It's a great picture of faith. It's a great picture of the effort of prayer. And, and it's this picture. I think it goes back to, to Jacob, where Jacob knows he has nowhere else to go. And through the night, he wrestles with God and says, I'm not letting go until you bless me. Well, there's some good things there. But let's jump forward a little bit. Going back to Genesis. Going back to Genesis 37. We uh, are going to kind of end that time of Jacob's life. By the way, Esau doesn't kill his brother. That works out fine. He doesn't kill him. We get to 37, which is really entering into the Joseph story, which we'll hope to cover in just a little bit here. And Jacob falls into the sins of his father again. Haven't we seen that picture in this book? And you would think that there was someone who realized what favoritism did to their home. It wouldn't do it to their own kids. But no, he loves Joseph. It's the son of his old age. And he shows favoritism to his son Joseph, which of course just makes the brothers hate Joseph. Gives him that coat, and they hate the coat. And uh, so Jacob has his favorite son. And the sons decide Joseph's got to go. Now, okay, we'll, we'll get to this story a little bit later. But what they do is, instead of killing him, they decide to just sell him into slavery. And so they take his coat that would be recognized as Joseph's coat. They dip it in the blood of a goat. And they bring it back to Jacob and say, Now, tell us, is this, is this your son's coat? Let's figure out if this is your son's coat or not. And the goes, oh, my son Joseph is dead. I'll go to my grave mourning. And Jacob's sons deceive their father. And there's this deception again, coming back to harm Jacob. We look at Jacob's deceptions. Jacob used a goat to deceive his father. Remember the goat meat and the goat skins. And Jacob's sons use a goat to deceive their father. And Jacob's parents lose their sons. Jacob has to run away to flee for his life. And then Jacob ends up losing his favorite son. Jacob's deceptions come back to harm him. And God brings back his deeds upon his own head. And let's look at the end of Jacob's life. Here's a sad picture. Uh, I don't know if you, you know this little episode. But as Jacob comes from Canaan land down to Egypt, and they're going to settle in Goshen, and Jacob kind of has this old figure, almost a prophet here. He's going to bless Pharaoh. He's going to bless Pharaoh. Uh, comes before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh looks at him and says, How old are you? So he said, maybe, maybe Jacob showed his years here. Um, in Genesis 47, verse 8, Pharaoh says to Jacob, How many are the days of the years of your life? And Jacob says to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. Well, isn't that a sad picture of your life? Like few and evil, few and hard. Evil, evil here in the Old Testament sense, we're talking about difficult, miserable. Few and evil have been the days and the years of my life. That's been his life. Did Jacob get away with those things? No, he got the blessing. 
He did, and the Messiah is going to come through <coughs> Jacob. And he got he got the the, the birthright, still sold that from Esau, and God blessed him and gave him herds and flocks <coughs> and things. When Jacob looks at his life, he says it's been a long, hard, miserable life. He says few, but but 130 years. That, that that's that's a lot of years. What we see here in this story of Jacob, one of the big lessons in Jacob's life is that we reap what we sow. It's been called the law of the farm, right? And so uh, we don't have much farming in New York City. But, but we still get farming down there to some extent. But you guys get it better than we do. Okay, so if you sow wheat, what do you get? Wheat. You, you plant some apple seeds, you're going to get an apple tree. You plant corn, you get corn. It's pretty straightforward. The things that you sow are the things you're going to reap. And that's the way God says life is going to be. Uh, God, over and over in the Bible, shows this. We, we, we again, kind of call it this ironic, poetic justice. But the things that we sow are the things which come back to either bless us or come back to harm us. Uh, this is encapsulated in Obadiah, verse 15. As you've done, it shall be done to you. Your own deeds shall return on your own head. How do we live our life? Do we live our life knowing that this is how God is going to operate? I mean, if we knew that this is how God's going to operate, this is kind of a big deal here. Our deeds are not like sticks where we throw them at people and things happen. Our deeds are like boomerangs. We need to see that. Our life is like the, these actions that go out and they're going to come right back to us at some point. Now, it could be that God determines that, that the blessing will come in the next life. And that those things will come later. God may say, no, in, in your life right now, you are going to reap the very things that you have sown. And that boomerang is going to come back awfully hard. Maybe in a good way, maybe in a bad way. But as you have done, it should be done to you. And don't we see that in Jacob's life? He deceives his kids deceive him. He takes things are taken from him. It, it, it doesn't work out. It doesn't work out. It's miserable. And, and that's the, the lesson that we see from Jacob. Let's say this principle played out in Scripture. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Don't be deceived. God won't be mocked. For whatever one sows, that which he will reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap. Uh, from the flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap life. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we don't give up. So many principles here. Don't give up. Don't stop doing good. Don't stop serving the Lord, because those things are going to come back and bless you. You will reap all those things you've sown if you stay faithful until the end. But you just want to start off by saying, don't, don't be deceived. You can't mock God. What do you mean mock God? Make fun of God? He says, you can't uh, see if you can work the system. You know, I'm going to work the system. I'm going to live my life of sin. I'm going to do all the fun things I want. At the end of my life, I've got time. You know I've got time. I'm young. I'm healthy. Things are fine. I will totally turn to God later on in my life. And uh, that's what we call mocking God. I mean, you're going to pull the wool over God's eyes. What's, what's wrong with that system? You say, okay, yeah, so what's wrong with that system? The thing is, is that sin hardens our hearts. And you're going to sow to the flesh, and you're going to learn fleshly things, and your heart's going to be trained in fleshly ways. And in 20, 30 years, 5 years, 1 month, you name it, is you're not going to have a heart for God anymore. And that seed's going to be sown in your heart, and the bridge is going to come down and take it, because you have a hard heart now. You're, you know, that's why you don't turn to God tomorrow. You turn to God today, because you may not have opportunity tomorrow, not because you died, because you just may not have the interest. And it may be gone. And you may never want to do spiritual things again. And there your soul, your soul is lost. You can't fool God. You can't mock God. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap from the flesh. If you sow spiritual things, you're going to reap those things. And God will bless you. What about this principle? This is all over the New Testament. Matthew. It's all over Matthew. If you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your Trespasses. Do you see the law of the tooth here? Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. Do you see that what you sow, you also reap here? God says, if you are willing to be forgiven, I will be merciful to you. Uh, James chapter 2 calls this mercy triumphing over judgment. And so if we're, we're, we're merciful, we're kind, we cut people slack. That's what Jesus is getting at in Matthew 7. Judge not, this should be judged. But the measure you judge will be judged back to you. If you're gracious, kind, patient, cut people slack, you work with people, how's God going to work with you? Graciously, merciful, patient, 
cutting you slack, working with you. But if we are on time, and you got to toe the line with me, and that's how God's going to be with you. I don't know about you, but I'm needing some mercy. I'm needing some help. So I had better be pretty merciful to others because that's the exact kind of way I need God to be with me. So I need to be humble. I need to be merciful because that's the way I, got, I need God to be with me. So I need to be forgiving. Remember that parable we talked about already this weekend? So shall God do to you if you don't forgive your brother from your heart, Matthew 18. You've got to forgive your brother from our heart. It's got to go. It's got to go from our heart. Because I need God to be forgiving me from his heart. And so I need to be able to uh, reap, <laughs> reap some mercy. Uh, so i got to be merciful to others. And that's what God has commanded us. But what about this principle? Here's two Proverbs that are kind of the opposite sides uh, of the same coin. Whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. There is a, your deeds are turning on your head for you, right? The poor cry out, you don't help them out. What God says is going to happen to you. When you cry out, God won't hear your cries. The other side of that, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord who repays for his deeds. I love this picture, right? If you give to the poor, you're really just lend to the Lord. What's the difference between giving and lending? Well, when you give, you don't you know, get back. When you lend, you get things back. You know, I'm lending you 50 bucks. And then you'll give me back 50 bucks. He says, when you give to the poor, you realize like you're lending to the Lord. You know, the Lord's a great person to lend to. Because if I lend him $1,000, is he going to make sure he pays that back? Absolutely. You give to the poor, it's coming right back to you. You're just lending to the Lord. He will repay you for those deeds. And so we, we see those, uh, those lessons there. We need to live life realizing that our deeds will return in our heads. As you have done, it should be done to you. So be merciful, be kind to the poor, be gracious and forgiving. And that's precisely how God will make sure you are treated. <coughs> and finally, we need to come to God with that humility of Jacob's prayer. Remember that prayer? That, Lord, I'm not worthy of the least of your blessings. I'm the least of your steadfast love and faithfulness. And we need that kind of humility when we come to God. Total humility, total appreciation for what God has done. Looking to God, looking at His promises, and not to ourselves. We need to to, to uh, bargain with God. Uh, we need to trust in God. Come to Him with His promises, and be thankful for the way that He's taken care of us. And Jacob's a really good example of that. And that's why, after those initial episodes where Jacob is not spiritual minded at all, can we see now how Jacob becomes a man of faith, ends up trusting in the Lord? And Jacob doing what God says. And an obedient, faithful man at the end of his life. I hope those things are encouraging. I hope that you can stick around in just about 10 minutes. We'll start our worship service. I hope that you can stick and join us uh, for that. Thank you.